you have your Bible and are willing and able to turn with me, we are going to turn to the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Today we begin a new series called What If? It's, uh, it's really about stewardship. We're going to look at different areas of stewardship. Stewardship is, again, let me bring it back to a simple way of explaining Stewardship is really the understanding that we own nothing, that it's all God's, and God has given us for brief periods of time, uh, responsibility and charge over different areas that he entrusts to us. Uh, one of those is children, right? When they're little, crying, you have to feed them and to care for them and do everything for them. But they're not really yours. God's entrusted them to you. But your children are not really yours, they're his. They're a gift from God to you and for us. It's the same way with your job or a marriage or a relationship or finances. So much of what we walk through in life, we as followers of Christ are called to view it differently than the way the rest of the world views all of that. Think about your time, how the world views their time versus how we view our time should be drastically different. And that's because we're stewards of a high king. The king owns it all. And he's placed us here on this earth and he's entrusted us with that, with everything that we have as his steward. This year we want to focus on prayer. Our whole theme for the year is to be devoted to prayer. There's a banner outside in the foyer. There's a verse for the month that's committed to that from Colossians chapter 4. I pray that you'll memorize that. I pray that you'll put that in your heart so that it may guide us and direct us as we walk through a full year. If you're anything like me, and I've been told this, I was never diagnosed this, but I have a, an attention deficit disorder. Yeah, some of you raised your hand. Yeah, I... I can see a rabbit running and like, oh, that's cool, or a squirrel or anything like that, and get so distracted. One of the things that helps us throughout this year and helps me is to say, okay, what's, what's a theme? What's something that we can ask the Lord for and to be focused on as we walk throughout? And that's why last year we focused on walking by faith. And I really believe there's a strong connection. And if you were in our Logos class this morning, Nathan Zion helped us to see there's a connection between our faith and prayer. And so we want to focus on that. We want to be learning and growing. I think anybody, and I, I'll just ask for you to raise your hand. Anybody in here feel like they pray enough? Raise your hand. Good. That means we all got work to do, right? Uh, it, it is very humbling to think, as I sat in last week's class on, the, on prayer, I, I'm your pastor and I struggle with prayer. And yet I'm supposed to shepherd and care for you. And it's so humbling because I, 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 I really need to grow in that area. And that's one of the reasons why I've put this. It's not just for us, but it's for me too. It's for me to grow. And so when we think about stewardship, it's been... Uh, my tradition to walk through in the month of January stewardship because I think it sets the year off. We just came away from giving gifts and celebrating the greatest gift, Jesus. And so we start this new year and we say, okay, we are stewards of the high God. How can I look forward to this new year and plan according to what he desires? And so our theme this year is prayerful stewardship as we walk through this next month. That's our theme, prayerful stewardship. And then two words, what if? Now, that may scare you or it may excite you. There are some that would say, what if? And it brings like anxiety, right? What if somebody breaks in tonight as you're laying there in bed? What if I didn't lock the door? What if I didn't lock the door in the car? That's me, all right? I'm just laying there and I'm like, Okay, did I lock the front door, the back door, the side door? Is the garage door open? And I say the garage door because when we first moved in, I left it open several nights. It was kind of a test to see if we were in a safe neighborhood, really. The first night that we moved into our home, I left the keys in the door. I got up this, in the morning to come and 
to church and I couldn't find my keys anywhere. And finally, I grabbed Lisa's and I headed out the door and there were mine right in the door. That's a good test. So now I'm always, before I go to bed, I'm always checking the locks. I'm always checking to make sure things are buttoned up. What if? What if I didn't do that? What if the electricity goes out? What if my child does this? What if I lose my job? There, there's all kinds of different questions that we can begin to, to do to ourselves as we ask that. What if that can provide a lot of anxiety and a, and a lot of stress? But there's another side of what if. Like, what if I win the lottery? I don't play, but if I did, what if? I'm not saying that you should play the lottery, okay? I don't know that that's a good use as a steward of God. Maybe I'll preach a sermon one day on gambling. But uh, what, when we think about what if, the, what if the Browns would have won yesterday? Could they have won it all? You know, there's this excitement of, of what if, what if, what if that girl that I've always had an eye for, what if she talked to me? So there's almost two different kinds of this idea of what if. It provides the possibility uh, of, of growth, of God's blessing, of expansion. And yet there's this other real side that, is, that can provide fear and, and, and insecurity and anxiety. And I just ask you as we begin today, how, how do you view those two words? Prayerful stewardship, what if? And so the next four weeks, we're going to walk through different scenarios. What if we, and today we're going to look at, what if we humbled ourselves and prayed? We're going to look at a passage here in 2 Chronicles and unfortunately, this is a text that is often, often taken out of context, all right? And I, I don't want to do that this morning, and we're not going to do that to the best of my ability. We, let me challenge you as a pastor here real quick. When you read the Bible, don't take one or two verses out of where it's at and make it say what you want it to say. That's taking it out of the context, all right. It's, it's like writing, if I wrote you a letter and in the middle of that letter, I, I said that I hated something. Well, what is that? You could say I hated sin or I hated you or I hated somebody else or I hated donuts and I gave them up for the year, which I didn't, by the way. Um, but you can't just pull that one phrase out because then now you don't understand what the real context and meaning of it is. We, we have a passage here in, in Second Chronicles that we're going to look at that is critical to understand what it really says. And in the midst of that, what does it mean? What does it mean for Israel as we look at these Old Testament saying verses? But also, what does it mean for us today? Because the Bible still applies to us today too. Amen? So we want to look at that. I want to ask you, what if when we trust God, we believe that he can do far more with what we give in our lives and in the lives of others than we could possibly or imagine or do on our own? Imagine what God would do through us if we would really trust in him with what he has blessed us with. This morning, I'm going to challenge us with our own heart. And so we're going to look at this verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Would you stand with me? Jimmy said yes, he will. One verse. This may be the shortest standing and reading of Scripture all year long, so enjoy it, okay? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Will you pray with me, Lord? We pray 
for your work in us, that you would help us to better understand how we can live lives as prayerful stewards, desiring to humble ourselves and to pray. Help us to see how we can do that in a better light today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If, 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 what if? Verse 14 starts with this word, if. If my people, when we think about stewardship, we think of possession. And I want to ask you, whose possession are you? We, as Christ followers, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are the Lord's children. I love what John has to say immediately when I thought about this. It takes me back to when I was in Awana as a kid in this verse I learned in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I learned it in a little bit different um, translation than the version that will be up here. Mine was, behold what manner of love. All right, This version is a little bit different. See what kind of love. But I like the King James version there. Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. I've said this before, but just talk, take a moment. The God of the full entire universe, the creator who made everything that we see and don't see, the God who keeps everything in line and, in, and is in charge of all things, that God we get to be called his child. So if my people, if you're one of God's people, you are his child. I love what not only he says in verse 1 there of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, but also verse 2. We are God's children now. Don't forget that. When we start and as the Lord is talking to the people of Israel here. He begins, and we're going to see the context of it, but he, he begins by helping them to understand and not forget, who are you? Whose possession are you? I pray and hope that you are the Lord's child. And if you aren't, this morning he invites you to a relationship with him. That relationship comes only through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died upon the cross for you. He took your sin and all that you've done wrong, all of our wrongdoing. He took on the sin, the sin on his shoulders and he died on the cross bearing that sin. And the punishment that was needed, he carried it on our behalf. And he was buried and he rose again three days later, conquering sin and death. That's the gift of salvation that God offers to you and to me. And because when we accept that free gift, we become his. We're his possession. I love what one mother replied when she was asked. She was the mother of three unruly preschoolers. I don't know if you've ever been there, mothers or fathers. But she was asked if she would have children if she had it to do all over again after having these three unruly ones. And she noted and responded and said, sure. Just not these three. Aren't you glad that God doesn't look at us like that? Who are we? If my people who are called by my name. By whose name are you called? Interesting when you go back and you look at scripture. And you kind of look at the context of how different followers of Jesus. And what they've been called throughout the years. Uh, we represent Jesus ultimately. That's what we're called as ambassadors. Paul tells us that in the New Testament. But it's interesting as you walk through the book of Acts, you see um, the gospel spreading, going from just Jerusalem and being spread out to different, different towns, different communities, different, different cities and villages. And as the word goes around, People start accepting this message of Jesus as the Messiah. And as they do, 
Uh, we see here in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, this first time this term is used, which is roughly 44 AD, okay? We can put a rough time frame on this. So if Jesus dies roughly in 33 AD, 11 years later, this term is coming around and is being used. And ultimately, this term starts off not as an endearing term. And actually, uh, this is a term that was probably derogatory all right, when it was first used, and, and I, I'll show you in just a moment where I kind of get that from as well. But, but we see this term Christians. It says when Paul had gone and, and, and he was there in Antioch, and as believers, the disciples there, as they heard, they were first called Christians. I think the context tells us here, this isn't by the insiders, this isn't the church calling them Christians. No, this is the outward community there calling them Christians. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, you're suffering as a Christian, so don't be ashamed. Glorify God in that name. Interesting that Peter would encourage them and say, hey, don't be ashamed of being a follower of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of that name of being a Christian. Now, through the course of time, that's changed. And we've walked through history in the history of America where, where a good percentage, over half of the people of America, would probably still call themselves by that name. Does that make them a Christian? No, just like naming my dog. Bernie Kosar doesn't make him a great quarterback, which I don't have a dog, and Bernie was a good quarterback. We see before this term Christian that it was people of the way. They were labeled, they were given this title, people of the way. And that came from Isaiah in verse four, chapter 40, verse 3, where it says, prepare the way of the Lord. And so as you had the Messiah coming, the Messiah came and John the Baptist of preparing that way. You have these followers who were called the followers of the way. The way is used several times as you read through the book of Acts. Ultimately, I like to call myself a follower of Jesus. Because the term Christian has become something that is difficult to define and so many people will claim it. I'll quickly say... I'm a follower of Jesus. When you think about your life and you think about this, whose name are you called by? Are you ashamed of that name? Or are you willing to stand up and say, no, Jesus is my Savior and I follow him. That's part of stewardship, is it not? When we think about coming and acknowledging Whose property we are? Whose name have we taken? I've shared this story before. One of my favorite memories of dropping Lene off for her first dance uh, in high school. Before they went to the dance, they went to, uh, out to eat with a group of girls, with other fellow girls. And their place of restaurant was not some high-scale restaurant, but it was a great restaurant. It was Chick-fil-A. All right, like every dad's wish, like here's 20 bucks, you go to Chick-fil-A. That's great. Much better than other places, cheaper. But as she got out of the car, I said, hey, remember who you are. And she knew exactly what I meant because she responded and she said, I'm a Varner. And I said, that's right. And I said, remember who you love. And her friend whipped around and she said, Jesus. Whose name do you have that you're called by? And if you're not called by the name of Jesus, you need to stop and look and say, whoa, do other people know? Can they not see? Does my life not exhibit one who is a steward of Jesus? As we continue in this verse, and I promise, again, I will get to the context of it. We're just walking through phrase by phrase. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves. Humble themselves. Uh, 
through the years, I've struggled to try to help. How, how do you define certain words and where do you look? And, you know, Google's great, but I desire something deeper and a little bit more theological than what Google has to tell me. So I found years ago, uh, Noah Webster, uh, and on the internet, there was uh, a copy of his 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary. And uh, when I went away on a sabbatical and I came back, I don't know why, I think it was for my sabbatical, Georgia and Bernie had, or Georgia and Bernie and Pastor Dave and Emily had bought me the, the, the real book. And it's about this big, all right? And so I don't have to look on the internet anymore, but it's about this big. And it's just really exclusive and, and really cool how he defines different terms. And so I looked up in, in Noah's Webster from 1828, and I encourage you to do that as well when you're trying to define some terms. I think it's really helpful for us as Christ followers to think about that. But Noah writes this as an adjective, humble, to be low or opposed to high and lofty. To be low, opposed to lawfully or great. To be non-magnificent. This third definition of uh, an adjective here of, of, of humble is to be lowly, modest, meek, submissive. Opposed to proud, haughty, and arrogant or assuming. In an evangelical sense... Having a low opinion of oneself and a deep sense of unworthiness in the sight of God. And then he quotes here from James chapter 4. God resists the proud but give grace to the humble. As a verb, he defines humble as this. To abase, to reduce to a low estate. To crush, to break, to subdue. To mortify, to make humble or lowly in mind, to abase the pride of, to reduce arrogance and self-dependence, to give a low opinion of one's moral worth, and to make meek and submissive to the divine will. And then he quotes 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. And then he quotes here. Hezekiah humbled himself from the pride of his heart. Second Chronicles 32. Let me pause for just a moment. And let's talk about this. Hezekiah who humbled himself from the pride that was in his heart. Hezekiah served 18 years as the reign of king. And he actually he was a king who loved God. It says that he did right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. So why is Webster here quoting for us that Hezekiah had to humble himself? It's because he saw all the blessing that he had and he realized uh, he began to become haughty of spirit. He began to be prideful and looking at all that he had and he puffed out his chest. And he said, look at all that I have. And as you read in the text, Hezekiah 32, you see how God humbled him and humbled the nation. And ultimately, Hezekiah humbled himself. He repented and asked God to forgive him of his pride. Even a king who did right in the sight of God is subject to pride. None of us can escape pride. None of us can escape this idea of thinking that, that we know what's best. He also, Webster continues to say, to make to condescend. As an example, he humbles himself to speak to them. Next he says, to bring down, to lower, to reduce. And then the final one is to deprave of chastity. And he talks about this in Deuteronomy um, 21, which I find interesting because I, I just want to take a moment, and this is a little rabbit trail, but I have it in my notes anyway, because I just thought it was really cool. Deuteronomy is full of some really cool stuff, right? 
If you haven't read through the book of Deuteronomy, let me encourage you to do so. You'll find some really cool things. And for those of you who want to live under the law, I challenge you, live under the law here. Instead, we like to pick and choose what we do. But let me give you a little illustration of the law in Deuteronomy chapter 21. And I'll read for you in verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not, he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, Our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Whew. Zach, you better behave, dude. How would you like that, Logan? Eli? Dimitri? I won't call anybody else out. <laughs> Dylan? You're going to be rebellious? You're going to, again, the opposite of humility here we see. Here's an example. And God takes it so seriously that he's telling his people, I want my people to have a humble heart. And if you, as a kid, you can't do that as a son to listen to your, your father and your mother, I want you to take them out to the city gate and I want you to end their life. I am not telling you to do that today. That we are no longer under the law. I am not saying that. But I am calling you to pay attention to grasp the principle and to grasp the character of the same God of the Old Testament is the same God that we worship today. And when God looks upon the proud and the arrogant and the person who wants to live life according to the way they want to, he says, no. Off with your life. Because why? Because you're going to affect everybody else. And you're going to bring other people down. It's an interesting note as we see here in the context of the law, but we see the character of our God who is righteous and just and holy. Now, it may be good, Andy, if you need to use that passage and a threat to your boys, but it's a really a call to all of us in this sense of, of this idea that we would humble ourselves. The whole definition is kind of defined in a few very simple terms. Low, crush, reduce arrogance and self-dependence to bring down. And what does our world tell us? The opposite. You can do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a confidence that God's gifted you. Or that you don't have the, the qualities in order to do what God's called you to do. But anytime we begin to think that we can do it. It's pure, utter idolatry. What I'm realizing in my own life. Is I worship a lot of idols. And one of the greatest ones. Is me, myself, and I. The call here is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. This is our first step. To bring ourselves low. To bring down. Ultimately, I want to play God. Would you be so honest this morning with yourself and with God to say you like to play God too? 
Ultimately, I think this is lowering myself below the righteousness and the holiness of God to come under him. To humble ourselves. Next, he says, and pray. To speak and to listen to God. I think this is purposeful, and I think it's pointed. I think this is a confession. We see it in 1 John 1, 9, when John tells us that if we confess our sin, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. He writes that to believers, to Christians, to those who are followers of Jesus. That isn't just at that point of salvation that we confess. No, we continue to sin. If you don't think that you sin, you lie and deceive yourselves and you deceive God. No, we are called to humble ourselves and to pray. And where we start is this. We realize who God is in our humility and we confess that we fall short of that. E. Stanley Jones writes this in A Song of Ascents. He says, prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from a boat, an anchor in our terms today, all right, a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to the will of God's. To pray. We'll continue to walk through what that looks like throughout this full year. Then he says this, and seek my face. This took me to a passage that I saw in my own walk with the Lord, my devotions uh, uh, a few weeks back. When I was reading about Moses, and Moses records this in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, where God is talking to Moses, and when he says this, the Lord speaks to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. So as we think about that, and as we talk to each other today, and you're going to talk to each other face to face, I don't think you talk to somebody like this. Um, if you do, that's pretty rude. I would encourage you not to, all right? But we've learned etiquette, like you, you etiquette, the proper etiquette. I don't know if etiquette is a word or not, but Seth, is it a word? Okay. He's my running definition or uh, encyclopedia. He's keeping track of all my words that are not real words and going to publish a book one day. So I told him as long as I get some of the royalties, he's privileged to do that. The proper etiquette is you turn and you're looking at that person, right? You're acknowledging who they are as you talk, but as they are talking too, you're looking at them. That's the picture here. Moses talking face to face. It's like he is talking to God face to face. That's what it's like. And as he comes down out of the mountain, it becomes very clear to the people of Israel that Moses has had this face to face talk with God because his face is so bright. It's illuminating to the point where Moses, when he's not talking with God, he wears a veil. When we think about seeking after the face of God, it took me to this idea of Moses speaking with God. And how do we seek after God face to face? We have this great privilege to be able to go to God. And yet, as we humble ourselves, as we see his righteousness and his justness and his goodness, we also see that verse in 1 John 1, 9 that I've already quoted, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So we have the boldness to enter into the throne of grace. We have the opportunity, but we're so shy or we're so proud for or we're so, so unbecoming because we're not worthy of it. Yes, we're not worthy, but God desires and he's saying, seek my face. 
pray and seek my face. They're, they're similar, but there's a difference here. I love what uh, the late Donald Barnhouse said. He's a greatly admired American pastor and author. And he came to the pulpit one day and he made a statement that stunned his congregation. And Charles Swindoll talks about this in his book, Strengthening Your Grip. Charles Swindoll writes that Barnhouse stood up and he said this, prayer changes nothing. And you could hear a pin drop in that Sunday service in Philadelphia. His comment, of course, Wendell writes, was designed to make Christians realize that God is sovereignly in charge of everything. Our times are literally in his hand. No puny human being, by uttering a few words in prayer, can take charge of events or change them. God does the shaping and he does the changing. It is God who is in control. Swindoll writes, while Barnhouse, Barnhouse was correct, except in one minor detail, and I agree with Swindoll here, prayer does change something. Prayer changes me. When you and I pray, we change. And that is one of the major re reasons prayer is such a therapy that counteracts anxiety. When we think about meeting God face to face, there's something that happens. We're changed. When I don't meet with God, my life starts going like this. But when I meet with God face to face and I'm talking and listening to him, the change in my life is real and evident. This call to pray and to seek my face. The next phrase, and to turn from their wicked ways. To turn from their wicked ways. We would use this term here called repent. Interesting, as I've grown up in the church and done a lot of studying, I've never really looked at this word repent in, from the Greek standpoint. It's used often in the New Testament. And we would use it as somebody who is turning from something. It is it, it has been used, the Greeks use it as a military term for an about face. But there's something more to this term, what I found. This term, metatonia, is actually best defined as a change in one's mind or heart. I love what Martin Luther, as uh, the Middle Ages, as they were focused a lot during that period of time on penances, the Protestant Re Reformation kind of reevaluated that. And, and as Martin Luther was exploring, he looked at this term and he said this. He said, this term is coming to one's senses. It's a knowledge of one's own evil Gained after punishment has been accepted and error acknowledged. And this cannot possibly happen without a change in our heart. When we think about this, when I think about this, we, we think, okay, yeah, I have to turn. And we can change our behavior. But if my heart isn't changed first, my behavior won't last. It, this is repentance. It's an acknowledgement to say, not that I was caught. Because sometimes you've been there when you were caught doing something wrong, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. Now, are you sorry because you were caught? Or are you truly sorry and you're not going to do that again? Well, I kept going to the cookie pot and trying to get the lid off without it clamoring. Even though I was sorry when I got caught. No, repentance is that. It's the changing of our mind. It's the changing of our heart. I realize, I acknowledge that what I have done is wrong. I acknowledge the righteousness and the perfection of God. And I missed that mark. 
And because of that, I need to make some changes. Second Chronicles chapter 12 helps us with the story of Rehoboam. It's interesting. Again, we're going to look at this in a moment, I promise. In Second Chronicles 7, it's really Solomon, and, and he's, he's a, uh, they're, 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 the temple has been completed. And they're praising God and worshiping. They're dedicating the temple to God. And that's the context. Well, in just one generation, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is here. And it says in 2, Solomon, or 2 Chronicles 12, verse 14, he did evil. Rehoboam did evil for he did not, what? Set his heart to seek the Lord. Here we have just a few chapters before the call. Listen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Did Rehoboam did that? No, he set his heart not to seek the face of God. I think it's summed up in this way when we think about this idea of repentance and turning, turning from our wickedness. A change of mind and heart always leads to a change of actions and behavior. I'll say that again. A change of mind and heart always leads to a change of actions and behavior. But a change of actions and behavior do not always exhibit a change of heart or mind. The call is to turn from our wicked ways. That is after we humble ourselves and we pray. And we seek the face of God. Because when we seek after God, he says, he is in a place where he can be found. And when we see God, we start to see who we really are. And his grace and his mercy and his love, his forgiveness. But we see also the wretchedness of who we truly are. Which leads us then to what? To turn from our wicked ways. So let me ask you, what if... We humbled ourselves and we prayed and we seek the face of God and we turn from our wicked ways. The context back in Deuteronomy or back in Chronicles chapter 7 tells us this that if you then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear the, heal their land. Here's where. The context comes into play because in verse 11, Solomon has finished the house of the Lord and his house, the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and he said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence against my people. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be upon, and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place." In the context, it's Israel coming before the Almighty God who has dedicated this great place of worship, of wanting a place, a home for God. It started with David when he looked out and said, I have a home, but yet we don't have a home for God. And this desire of building a temple and having a place where God would come and meet with his people. And so God saw that, and David wasn't worthy to be able to build that temple, but David was instrumental in gathering all the, the, the needed supplies. And it comes to Solomon, his son, who now gathers those supplies, and they build this temple, and it's great, and it's mighty. You read through the book of Chronicles, and you see the different, the different kings and 
The queen of Sheba has heard stories about this magnificent uh, temple. And yet when she gets there, she says, it's beyond what even was said to me. This is great. This is magnificent. In that context, as they're praying and asking God to come, and this is your place, we want to meet with you. God was honored and he was pleased with that. But it's almost like he is foreseeing what is going to come. Because he says, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then he goes right in and he says, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. When this stuff happens, remember. Ultimately, it's because they've turned from him. And you read in the next few chapters, and we've already touched it with Rehoboam, in his heart, because he did not seek God, he was evil. And he turned from God. Ultimately, there is a point where the people realize all that's going on, and it says that they humbled themselves. Second Chronicles chapter 12 says, During the reign of of Rehoboam, verse 2, the fifth year of the king of Rehoboam, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord. Why? Because he had abandoned, verse 1, chapter 12, abandoned the law of the Lord and all of Israel with him. So when God is talking in chapter 7, it's almost like he knows chapter 12 is coming. Verse 5, you abandoned me, so I abandon you. Here they were in chapter 7 of uh, of 2 Chronicles, and there's this great uh, excitement, this great joy. But it doesn't last long. Once Solomon dies and Rehoboam takes over, what happens? They abandon God. They start worshiping other gods and other idols and other things. And so God says, you abandon me, I abandon you. And it says in verse 6 and 7, Then the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous. It's all of what we were just talking about. That God said, If you do this, then I will what? It says in verse 7, When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. They have humbled themselves and I will not destroy them. But I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem. God saw that they had humbled themselves, and ultimately he says, I will not destroy them. God says, if you do these things, if you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek my face, and you turn from your wicked ways, then I will what? What does he say there? I will hear from heaven. Again, helping them to realize, I'm not in the temple. I'm not amongst you. Israel, I will hear you though, even though I'm not there, I will hear you from the heaven. And I will what? I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. Interesting as we look at this. While I think there were times of famine. I think there was a picture. A word picture here too. We see this idea of rain throughout the Old Testament. Rain is really a blessing. So the next time it rains for three days. Look at it as that okay. Because without rain. What would we have? Right? Drought and famine. But Old Testament. As The Lord is talking here. I believe there will be no rain. Your land will have no rain. Meaning you will not enjoy my blessing. And then he says this. I command the locusts to devour the land. We know through history as we read. It's not just these little animals that are devouring the land. No, it's other people and other enemies of Israel who are going to come in. And defeat them. And devour their land. To take up their land. And then we see he's going to send a pestilence. A sickness and a death upon the people of Israel. 
And so I believe a lot of this is a word picture here as God prepares his people under Solomon's rule here as, they've, as they have built this magnificent temple to worship God for God saying, I will come and I will, I will be there and I will listen to you. But let me tell you, when you abandon me, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to get it right away. I'm not going to send my blessing. I'm not going to allow you to enjoy the safety and the quietness of peace. No, I'm going to send enemies to defeat you. And you're going to have to go through hardship and struggle and sickness. But when you see it all, remember that if you, my people, who are called by my name, will humble yourselves... You'll humble yourself. I'm pretty proudful. I got a lot of pride in my life. I'm not here to throw a stone, but my guess is you got a lot of pride in your life too. And what pride does is pride ultimately takes us away from the Lord. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's us today. The principles are still the same, even though this is a direct and clear uh, statement to Israel. This isn't a statement to America. I didn't hear any amens, but let me be very clear. This statement as the Lord is talking to Solomon in the night is a statement to Israel. The principles apply to us today too, though. And they would apply to our country I don't have the jurisdiction or the authority to control our country, though. But what I have authority over is me, myself, and I. And you do, too. While you may think you have control over your husband or your children, you don't. Or over your wife or over your co-workers, you don't. You have authority over yourself. And so these principles apply to us, and they can apply to our nation if we will collectively, as a people, do them. But the call here today, as we think about prayerful stewardship, is to think about this idea of what if. What if you, what if I, what if we humbled ourselves and we prayed? What if it provides thoughts of a lot of opportunities that may just be around the corner, If I do this, what is there? But what do you do? Let me encourage you to begin with prayer. Say, I struggle with praying. Just pray. Humble yourself. Acknowledge that God's there. And talk to him like you talk to any other person face to face. May we humble ourselves and may we seek the face of God this week. And then let's see what God will do. One author puts it this way. You can't have the promises without the process. So let's walk through the, prop, the, the process this week so that we can enjoy the promises of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you provided and you watch over us. Thank you for the truths of your word. Thank you that the principles still apply to us that we read here in 2 Chronicles. We see them all throughout scripture. If your people, if your children, if we humble ourselves, 
if we acknowledge and realize that we often make ourselves mightier and greater than you, Lord, if we acknowledge that and come humbly before your throne, you are faithful and just to hear us and to make us right in your sight again. Help us to seek you, to seek your face, to seek after your ways. May it not be said of us as we enjoy the blessings of where we sit today, where we walk away and we abandon you. Like Israel enjoyed that day of dedication and yet not many years later they abandoned you. They abandoned their faith. Lord, we can quickly do that. Our country has quickly done that. And we pray that you would forgive us. We come humbly acknowledging that we fall very short of your perfect standard. Our nation has turned away from you. And yet, just as Israel had a remnant, Lord, there is a remnant. And part of that remnant that lives in America sits here today at West Hill Baptist Church that's streaming in today from their homes. We desire and want to see your blessing in our life, and yet we acknowledge that it is not about our way and our will. Part of being a great steward for you is acknowledging that you alone are God and that we must humble ourselves before, below behind your mighty hand. As we do that this week, Lord, we hold to the promise that as we humble ourselves, that you will exalt us. Not in the eyes of man necessarily, but in your eyes. And that's all the eyes that matter. We want to be exalted in your eyes. We want to, to, to make you pleased with us. We want to honor your name that you've given to us. Because we are yours and we represent you. So help us to do that. This day and the week ahead and the days ahead, Lord. As prayerful stewards. Help us to grasp hold of this concept and this idea. That if we humble ourselves and pray. You will hear us from heaven. And you will forgive us. And you will heal us. So as we leave here, Lord, we ask for your blessing. Not because we deserve it, but because we want to show the light of the world to the world. And may that be an on display for them. Not so that we can be proudful and arrogant or haughty and look and see what we have. We have the blessing of God. We deserve that. No, may we exhibit the blessing of yours for a world to see that we are unworthy of having that. But yet because of your child, being your child, Lord, you desire to, to pour your blessing on us. And we thank you for that. We are unworthy. And yet we ask for your blessing. May we use it for your glory, for your honor, and so that the world may know that there is a Savior, Jesus as we leave here today, watch over and care for us. Help us to honor you through our hearts, our minds, and our behavior and our actions. We pray this in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one who we follow. Jesus. Amen. God's blessing on you as you go today. Stay warm. Invite somebody to come with you next Sunday.